welcome to Dialogue. Because of its fast-growing economy and young population, India has become an increasingly important market and popular destination for global business and investment. However, foreign businesses exiting India have outnumbered those entering over the past few years. Why have so many foreign companies shut down businesses in India? For multinational corporations operating in India, how can they benefit from the Indian market while minimizing the risks of being penalized by the local government? To help us answer these questions and more, I'm joined by Professor Swaran Sin from the School of International Studies of Jawaharlal Nehru University, Charles Liu, founder of Hall Capital and a senior fellow at the Taihe Institute, and Anna Tangen, independent current affairs commentator. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingdu. Well, welcome to Dialogue. Uh, Anna, we'll start with you. Uh, we know India, when people look at the market, you know, it's large, young population, and also geopolitically, you see India is being courted by the West, the US, the Europeans, you know, Russia, even China, despite the border issues. Uh, you know, if you look at those elements, you would see this is very attractive for foreign investors. But at the same time, you, know, you hear complaints, you hear unhappy episodes or unsuccessful deals uh, with the Indian market there. So how do you characterize uh, India as a destination for foreign investors? Well, this is the problem. I I India is not one nation. Uh, what it is is a b bunch of very strong provinces uh, that have almost autonomous rules. They make up their own uh, uh, you know, taxing rules, etc. Uh, the central government has been trying to bring it into line, but it's been very, very difficult. The history of India is that you have strong local governments and a, a slightly weaker national government. Uh, in order for things to change, there would have to be a kind of reversal of that. Because every time you go to a different province, you're dealing with a completely different uh, setup. Um, and it can be quite hostile. Uh, they'll say, well, why didn't you come to us first? Why did you go to that other province? And they'll try, they'll try to you know, bargain with you and you say, look, I'm just trying to do business. Uh, Xiaomi has seven plants uh, in India. And I can tell you, you know, they'll, if you want to pay somebody uh, on a monthly basis, uh, you have to get you know, 30 or 40 different stamps from different officials, all right, just so that you can pay them because without those stamps, it's not you know, official. So each one of those, it's, uh, let us say, a small opportunity to earn money. Um, you know, it's a country where the, a, a policeman in Mumbai is not paid enough to pay his rent. So I think that gives you an idea of, mm -hmm. of the kind of problems you, that you have. The infrastructure is, is really having a hard time. Right now, all the rivers have kind of dried up and as a result, they're, they're experiencing severe shortages. Uh, blackouts are common, brownouts are common, scheduled uh, blackouts. So you can't run your business as you see fit. You're subject to the environment that you're in, and it can be very, very tough. So, I mean, there's so many instances we could, we could be talking about, you know, the fact mm -hmm. that the government has seized funds <laughs> from uh, 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 Chinese companies, and it's just holding it there, and it's, it looks like it's for, you know, being held for ransom. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Singh, you know, uh, Anna mentioned about, like, red tape, you know, bureaucracy. I guess, you know, it, it exists also in other countries. It's really about the degree, right? Uh, and also, uh, you know, the, the reg regu uh, our regulations, you know, whether they are, uh, you know, too complicated or not, things like that. I understand that, you know, it's, it, foreign investment is a, it's a win-win. Uh, you know, process, you know, foreign investors, they want to make money out of the destination, you know, of investment. And for the countries which receive the foreign investment, of course, you know, they, they would like to see more jobs being created and then revenue increased. Uh, but, you know, looking at the issue from inside India, you know, how do you evaluate the situation? The shared common consensus today around the world is that India is the fastest growing economy. And not just that, it's the largest market with enormous uh, uh, infrastructure deficit, potential for consumption, uh, inexpensive labor, uh, English-speaking uh, uh, large population. That creates a very attractive business environment uh, for foreign companies to think of investing in India and making profit. And I understand your program today is pegged on a certain number of countries, uh, companies exiting India. 
And I believe that uh, you have seen this statistics coming from India's Minister of Commerce himself speaking in India's parliament, saying that a certain number beyond 2,000 plus com uh, companies have left India in last seven years. But if you look at that speech carefully, in the same speech, he also says, for the same period, 10,000 plus companies have also come and set up offices in India in the same time, taking the total number of companies and their subsidiaries to 12,000 plus. So it's a, it's a you know game of uh, give and take where some companies are coming, other companies are leaving. But larger picture is large number of companies are coming. India's uh, statistics of foreign direct investments are rising enormously. There is no denying that some companies, of course, will also have difficulties in you know dealing with the Indian situation. India is also learning step by step, evolving over a period of time. But you know some of the cases could also be of over ambition, of you know almost trying to strike gold in India, which is not possible. You know, let me say India is a very price sensitive market as of now. So it will take time, like China did over several decades, to become brand conscious market over a period of time. And in that sense, there are enormous opportunities and also certain hiccups. Uh, it's a mixed game, but bigger picture, I think, is uh, very, very uh, uh, impressive and attractive. And that is seeing more and more countries coming and investing. They are learning to how to work in India, just like India is learning how to deal with them and facilitate them to make profits in India and contribute to India's own make in India ambitions. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll come back to you, uh, Professor, with some numbers you mentioned about, you know, the companies being closed, uh, companies being set up in this country, uh, some numbers from Indian media. Uh, but before that, uh, uh, Charles, I know that, uh, you know, as far as I understand, you once did investment in India. Uh, can you share with us, you know, your experience? I think uh, the problem I had in looking at a very specific investment in India uh, was in mining. And my partners and I were ready to put up the funding to build a railway for certain mines to be shipped to the port and upgrade the port. The regulatory process of cutting through several states or provinces was so horrendous it was six years before we were able to even get the approvals to start the project. Now time is money in business. We just simply can't afford to have inconsistent regulatory process, totally diverse, as the professor said, diversity can be considered as a positive factor, but the diversity in terms of regulatory schemes, in terms of taxation, in terms of all of that, made it impossible that we had to drop the project. It's unfortunate. Now, I recall the same experience in China. If you're ready to develop a mine in China and you're ready to build a road, railroad to ship the ores out and you're ready to improve the port so the port can be used to ship larger quantities of the ore, I think there will be several provincial governors who will chase after you instead of asking for bribes, as the case we had, we, had, we had seen. It's going to be quite some time before India catches up in a modernization way. Mm -hmm. Well, as uh, Charles you know, talked about you know, navigating in India, uh, so Anna, to a certain degree, you know, as a foreigner you know, doing business in another country, it's, it's a challenge to navigate, you know, uh, with different departments, you know, different culture, uh, different practice. Sometimes I would say uh, people probably do expect certain challenges there. Well, yes. I mean, uh, look right now, they're trying to do chip factories in the United States. Well, it's going to cost, it's going to take uh, at least six months to a year longer to build the facilities. Time is money, especially with chips, because is, you, you have to get the chips out as quickly as possible before the next generation comes in. Uh, you, you also have the, have the labor available, and there are environmental regulations and things like that. So we're not just excluding, in particular to India, there are challenges everywhere. And even in China, there were challenges. I mean, there were a lot of companies that said, well, we don't want to do joint ventures. But India has taken a, a step further by saying that joint venture has to be majority held by Indians. 
and that the top management has to be from India. Um, you know, the CFO, CEO, et cetera. And, and that it is a particular challenge. I don't, I don't think if American companies were faced with the same thing that they, you know, they would just say, no, uh, we, we can't be in that kind of situation. Uh, what's curious to me is that you don't hear the same complaints about uh, what's happening in India versus what's happening in China. And I, I think this is, I'm not blaming India. I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that there's a double standard that uh, the U.S. is trying to court India to be a, um, basically a roadblock to China's expansion. Uh, you know, this idea of using, uh, you know, divide and conquer, uh, that, that was the colonial uh, mantra. You know, we go in there with our gunboats, we get one group on one side and one on the other side, and we have them fight it out. Meanwhile, we take everything. I mean, India was 24% of the world's GDP before the British came. It was 4% after they left. I think that tells the entire story, don't you? So, you know, at, at this juncture, the U.S. is, is pressing India. They're, they're saying, oh, it doesn't matter about this and that, human rights, things that we criticize China for, we won't criticize you for, your business practices, we won't criticize. But clearly, this is about manipulation of uh, India, uh, literally to put it up against China, because uh, the uh, United States in particular is afraid of the Asian century. If India were to cooperate with its neighbors, not just China, but everybody, ASEAN, join RCEP, things like this, you know, imagine the scope and uh, value that they could get, the, um, the amount of investment that would pour in if they could uh, you know, mm -hmm. normalize uh, a lot of our standardized, and say normalize, there's no normal, but standardize um, their practices so that in each state, no matter where you went, you didn't have to deal with these uh, multiple different issues and possible asks for money that no one wants to give. Mm -hmm. uh, but let me have this question for uh, Professor Steen. Uh, I, I think you know, Indians are smart enough to understand that the U.S. is trying to, let's say, uh, you know, have India to counter, you know, the Chinese influence to counter China. Um, but at the same time, I mean, India is smart enough, you know, to make good use of the geopolitical situation and for the benef benefits of India. Um, but, you know, speak of that, of course, you want to provide a good, I mean, as good as possible, uh, you know, investment environment to attract for, uh, investment, so to develop the economy. Um, do you think the Indian government is, say, simplifying the procedures or make it more attractive for investors? I think one quick yardstick to measure whether India is trying hard enough uh, is to look at the statistics over the last uh, seven or eight years of foreign direct investments. Now, if they have been really rising up, indeed, India today is seen as the fastest growing destination for foreign investments, just like China was at some stage. And China, of course, still is a great uh, destination for foreign investments. Uh, so that means in the judgment of large number of investors around the world, India is doing more or less fine. Now, I understand, uh, as Anar Thangan said and uh, Charles said, there are issues and these issues normally arise because you are entering as an investor in an alien land, in a new country. Now, that new country is not going to be either United States or China. It's going to be a different country, and that's the country we are discussing, India. And therefore, they will have their own nuances, their own understanding. For example, Anna Thengen mentioned about India insisting on you know, a lot of manpower being used locally including uh, the senior positions. That is because India has enormous amount, in fact, excess of skilled manpower in that sense. Uh, I think estimates are that India today contributes to about 24% of global uh, skilled workforce. Uh, and therefore, that is something which will be always uh, uh, you know, in mind when India discusses as to what will be arrangements of foreign investments. But, but, but Professor, India is also... Professor, sorry uh, for, you know, in, disrupted here. Uh, look, I mean, the, the requirement is uh, uh, basically re being reported here. Uh, the Indian government is asking the Chinese, uh, for example, the phone makers like uh, Xiaomi and uh, Oppo uh, or Vivo, uh, you know, positions in the company like a CEO, COO or CFO and CTO, uh, they must come from local talent must be held by Indians. Uh, I'm not sure, like, uh, you know, you can ask a foreign company, you know, to provide positions to the local talent. 
I mean, probably the fittest will be in a position instead of who or you know, all the Chinese, all the Americans, all Indians should be in that position. Don't you think so? That is exactly what I'm underlining, that each new destination will have its own set of modalities as to how investments will be accepted. And something I must underline is very often these issues are, you know, analyzed as if China is held, held out as a specific case where India has different standards. India has similar standards for several other companies. I mean, other phone companies like Vodafone have had issues. Uh, you see other companies like Twitter, Apple, they're also having Indian, you know, senior position people heading and, and controlling these companies. So that is something I'm trying to explain how India, looking at its own leverages, advantages and disadvantages, tries to build its own model, which is in conjunction, is in consultation with foreign investors. I'm not saying India is beginning, beginning to dictate and then, of course, India will not be an attractive uh, destination for investments. So it is both sides beginning to understand each other, learn from each other, and see how India can achieve best and how other investors can also achieve best. And what I'm saying is larger number of companies are finding it fine to continue investing and, and working with India, working in India. And there are a very small number of companies which have had difficulties, and some of them are actually rationalizing you know many of these multinationals have you know presence in multiple countries and they always you know upstick business from one and move to another so some of these numbers are also in terms of rationalization and others could have genuine issues uh, and which are again being tackled i understand case of xiaomi is there and it is following the legal procedure that india has for all companies that come to india let's let's have a charles away in charles i mean you you run businesses you run companies you know in different countries uh, I mean, have you ever you know, encountered such requirement from the government, like your invested company should have a CEO, like if you invest in Saudi Arabia, for example, should they have a local uh, Saudi Arabian to run your company as CFO or COO or CEO? Tindor, for 15 years, I worked in the United Nations doing projects all over the world. I have never seen any country would impose such requirements. And this is not the only issue in terms of ta ta tax regulations. Apparently, it's different state from state. So if you cross the state border, then you're in a new tax environment. And this thing about selecting Indians only for, for the CXO, CEO, CEO, COO, CFO, and CTO, is, is, it's unheard of. It's totally, totally, completely unheard of on a, on a worldwide basis in business. Even some of the most least developed countries in Africa would not demand these things. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's understandable. I mean, it's the fact that you do have like uh, uh, Indians, basically in the U.S., for example, running as CEO or CFO. Uh, multinational corporations. But I think it's okay, of course, if you are appointed based on merit, right? You are talented, you can do this. But it's different from being required, you know, from the government in particular. That's a different... Well, I mean, one of the things uh, that a lot of people believe is that because of sometimes the difficulties, if you're not from an important family, it can be very hard to climb the corporate ladder in, in, in India. You have the Ambanis, the Tatas, uh, you know, uh, these very large families which seem to consistently dominate. Even in, uh, you know, the BJP, which is, you know, is, is well, we're for the common man, but it, it seems that the same group is always getting uh, the lion's share of business. I mean, you've had some massive scandals. Uh, with some of these companies uh, to the point where they were accused of doing shell games. But let's be clear here. China does not wish India bad. All right? Not at all. No, not at I all. mean, uh, all, the, all the officials say is they, they scratched their head and said, look, there's so much potential and we could help. And we're not trying to dominate. But the idea that if we go in there, that uh, our majority partner, not minority partner, majority partner has to be a local company. And then they would be running the business. Uh, it's a cap capitulation of business standards. If I want to run a business, I don't go to another country and give it up. And, you know, and quite frankly, if you went to the United States 
And you said to, there are a lot of um, names like Patel, they own gas stations, they own hotels, motels, they own uh, uh, Dunkin' Donut shops and things like that, restaurants. If you said to them, oh, look, uh, you're here in America, you know, you've got to have a, a you know, white guy <laughs> running things. And, and by the way, he's going to be your majority partner. Uh, they, would, they would close up shop and go somewhere else. So it, it's not something where they, now I understand completely that every country has to have its own model and that India will learn uh, and it will adjust its model. But at this juncture, I, I think it's quite clear that this is a little bit too, too far, one step too far to go. So you know, for the sake of the world, India has to succeed. And I understand, you know, the story it has potential and it always will. I've heard that from many people. But the fact is you can't have that larger group of people who are in want. It's dangerous for the world. It's dangerous for India and hey. regionally. Well, exactly. We are talking about 1.4 billion people. Um, and there's, there's necessity for people, uh, you know, to increase the living standard. I mean, to have a decent way of life that's, uh, that's in the benefits of everyone around the world. Uh, so Professor Singh, you know, speak of that, of course, you know, like uh, uh, we are talking about also the, another sector, for example, the motor sector, you know, BYD, uh, they are talking about like 1 billion investment in India for a full lineup of EVs. You know, it's, it's a leader in this uh, industry. And uh, the reports say the Indian government is not keen to have this investment. Um, you know, before that, of course, there's a tightening rule on FDI from China. Does that have something to do with, you know, the border issue between the two countries? Uh, is that a, you know, the politics involved in the decision-making process? I think politics uh, uh, is everywhere. I mean, that is how the politics decides uh, for all sectors, whether it is education, agriculture, or uh, investments. So uh, I would not deny that uh, uh, politics ultimately uh, does influence how decisions are made. And from that perspective, uh, also perhaps it is possible. I can't vouch for it, but it's likely that uh, the relations between nations uh, also determine the comfort level as to how their investments will be contracted and how they'll be actually implemented on the ground. Uh, that is a possibility, of course. Uh, but at the same time, I think it is also interesting to see that uh, uh, India has been constantly trying to undertake reforms. I heard both other panelists with me speaking of uh, variations of taxation system from, from, from province to province. Uh, that may be a little dated now because uh, for several years now, India has set up something called uh, goods and services uh, tax system, which is a national generic system, which is applicable in all parts of the country. And, you know, in that sense, it's a prog process which is ongoing. In, the, in fact, even today in China, for example, you talk of consolidating and reforming much more your structures uh, of uh, governance and uh, decision making. Same is true for India. But then to anticipate as to what is happening in the United States should happen exactly in an identical fashion in India or what is happening in China, they may be a great examples of economic miracle, for example. But it's perhaps a wrong expectation to think India would replicate that model completely. And India has its own you know, advantages and disadvantages. India is very conscious of our uh, you know, sort craftsmen, for example, the, the micro, medium and small sectors to protect those sectors is often an important agenda because Indian politicians have to go back to elections and go back to voters every five years. In fact, India is always on some or the other election and therefore people on the ground matter. And you know, all policies can be just driven by making profit and then taking GDP much faster ahead. It has to look at equality, equity, justice and other issues. And they sometimes create their own you know, web of uh, sort of uh, regulations, uh, which uh, you know sometimes create issues for uh, investors. But at the same time, I keep underlining, no denying that some companies have had difficulties. Yeah, but then there are other companies who are working with India. So that is true of uh, the, the situation here. Some companies mm -hmm. are leaving, some companies are coming, but fundamentally much more companies are coming then companies that are exiting is, is what makes me comfortable that we are on a learning curve and that is constantly happening and you know just like i would say saudi arabia has not been producing uh, microchips for example 
So one would not expect them to be, you know, participating in an investment where they will be giving microchips. Mm -hmm. India is producing enormous manpower, and India would like to ensure that that skilled manpower is used. In fact, Indian ethnic okay. Indians are now all over the world. Okay, let's. Uh, let's uh, Anna, you are shaking your hands. So, but I, I think Professor Sin, you know, has said uh, for any country there are advantages, there are disadvantages. I think that's that's that's, that's equal for every country. And, but and do you think the Indian government is uh, is progressing in terms of, for example? In response to the complaints, for example, in response to the uh, to the uh, you know inconvenience, probably uh, during the process of investing in the country, they want to attract more investment. I think this is in the interest of India, of course. Do you think they are making the progress corresponding to those uh, uh, demand? Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't think. And the reason we're sitting here discussing this is because they're discriminating against Chinese businesses, and they're making that quite obvious. Um, if you say that you believe in the free market, uh, that you're a democratic free market uh, society, uh, then you should uh, live, live by that. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese are not taking advantage of Indian companies. Uh, Indian companies do have some gripes with China. Uh, a lot of them want to sell uh, generic uh, medicines here in China. Ironically, the chemicals to make those uh, generic medicines are actually made in China. So they're shipped to, to India, then they're, and they're made into, it, uh, into uh, you know, pharmaceuticals, and then they want to get a bigger share of the Chinese uh, market. So there are always going to be some frictions. But the issue, I, it's, not, it's not that India has to adopt China's model or the US model. They need to find their own model. But this idea, I was pointing out, that Indians themselves would not, for one instant, give away their company, the you know, majority share of their company, uh, to anybody else and then put some other uh, race in there simply because they're uh, from that country uh, and say, oh, yeah, you, you, you're going to be my CEO, CFO. Oh, that's fine. And in terms of manpower, India is at a deficit. Uh, you, you have, uh, in 2019, only 66 million people qualified as, as middle class. All right. In terms of, of, of literacy, only 40% of the people have completed uh, 12th grade. Now, you can say that, well, 40% of 1.4 billion people, that's a lot of people. It is. But the, the, the issue is, uh, you know, China is in the same, uh, you know, under um, 26, uh, they're at 99.7%. I mean, it's just virtually nothing. Uh, and this is very, very important. So, you know, when you're talking about these things, you have to be absolutely upfront. Uh, don't, don't, you know, try to gild it one way or the other. Countries have problems. Discuss them. Figure out ways to work together. I think it would behoove India to figure out how it can work with its neighbors rather than a hostile force that is many, many miles away and has a very, very different agenda. And that would be the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles, last word. Actually, I, I would really, really think it would be fantastic if India integrated itself into the larger Asian supply chain, which has been created between China, ASEAN countries, and even now, as we speak, Middle East and Central Asia are integrating into this large su supply chain. And this supply chain makes things more efficient. Instead of trying to create a new supply chain in India that is separate and distinct and completely off the current supply chain, which exists and has benefited a lot of people, I think it would be fantastic if India could join in a serious way. With that, we come to the end for today's discussion. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGT app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu Qinduo. See you next time.